So good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce all or some of the members of our department who have an international background. Uh, the purpose of this meeting today is to share our experiences about the opportunities and, uh, and the challenges when it comes uh, to uh, young researchers uh, moving from one country into another. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you Catherine uh, Atima in alphabetical order. That's what I'm doing. Emily, Anthony, uh, and Katerina. And uh, last not least, Elizabeth, who together with myself um, has the, the Austrian perspective of Austrians moving abroad. And, uh, and Chiara, Chiara, who is in charge of the organization of uh, this whole MOOC. Thank you to all of you for taking the time. I'm very much looking forward to learning from you. And I would like to start with the very first question and in alphabetical order, as always, Catherine, I'm sorry for this. I will probably start with you. So uh, perhaps briefly, where are you from um, and how is it to work in Austria? Okay, so um, I'm from Italy originally, um, but I'm half English, which I think does play a role uh, when you start moving around countries. Um, so just as background information, I studied in the Netherlands and the UK, and this is sort of the first um, working experience um, in a different country. So I think overall working in Austria is, um, is nice and definitely not too much of a hurdle for a foreigner. And uh, moving here has been a, a rather smooth transitioning. Um, I think there are some difficulties uh, I can compare with the Netherlands. But I think overall, I haven't been like uh, faced with many, many difficulties um, over the course of this year that I lived in Austria. So, but what were the the, the smaller difficulties that you <laughs> that that uh, you were confronted with? So, compared to the Netherlands, overall um, language is quite a big issue in Austria because, of course, like um, yeah, people in the Netherlands speak basically everyone speaks fluent English whereas here I was definitely faced with some difficulties. Overall I think from the um, public point of view I was actually surprised that it was working smoothly and information was available in English. I had more issues dealing with private entities. Mm -hmm. So although it seems like rather trivial but like um, I think when you have issues talking with your own housing agency about the most uh, smaller issues, then this obviously creates a lot of stress when you're moving into a new country. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like um, bureaucracy, I think the big and I think very active expert community of Vienna and Austria in general is very helpful. So there are a lot of guidelines online and this helped. Uh, sort of uh, guiding me through the various procedures. So this is very broadly. I think, um, I'm not sure if you want me to go into specific steps that I found difficult or... Yes, please, go. <laughs> so I think overall the, the aspect that I found uh, very different from the Netherlands was uh, the requirement of EU registration, which is after the sort of national registration at the council. And this is um, a sort of uh, step you have to go through if you're an EU citizen, but a citizen of any country in the world. And I think in other countries, this is already included in the council registration. And this was like one big <laughs> office in Vienna where you had to wait many hours without really understanding what was going on and all in German. And I found this like such a an odd, let's say, a bureaucratic step to go through um, since you already are registered in the council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was the biggest thing that surprised me, but overall, I think there was quite a lot of guidance and uh, the university itself provides information, at least basic information in English about health insurance and social security and so on. Yeah, so the, the major source for information that you had was the university or where did you, where did you get all the info that you needed? I think the starting point was the university, but then there are some, so the um, the website of the government, there is a specific one for foreigners in English, but um, unfortunately, often they do refer to the links that then are in German. So I think, so I do have a basic understanding of German and I had it at the beginning, but I guess if someone never ever <laughs> studied German, then this is obviously not very useful. Um, I think, private sort of expert communities are the most useful because they really um, wrote articles and guidelines 
to tell you what step what steps to follow. So mm -hmm. yeah, but and the university is helpful for more sort of specific um, employee issues, such mm -hmm. as health insurance is specific. So yeah, and did you find those expert communities online, or 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 did you go somewhere? <laughs> Um, no, definitely. I no, I used um, mostly online sources. So uh, there are a few expert communities and also specific on the countries. So, for example, um, social media groups, for example, the Italian social media groups are, were really useful. But I think there is a lot of information in general websites and uh, international communities. Yeah, I see. I see. Uh, Tima, for you probably it was even more difficult because of the fact that you are not European. At least, um, um, so how did you perceive the first days and weeks in, in Vienna? Um, so uh, I am originally from Nigeria, um, but I lived and grew up in South Africa. So coming from outside of the EU poses a whole different set of challenges. The first being the visa situation. I think that's the thing that makes most people the nervous when moving or going to work in another country um, because you can have a job and if you don't get the visa it's irrelevant you know so um, when I moved here I think it was my parents really encouraged me to get in touch with the people at the South African consulate and sort of build a relationship with them and that really helps to find out information of things that you might not know to find out little bureaucratic loopholes the consular can be really helpful to do that. But the visa process was actually not as stressful as I expected it to be because Austria has a special researcher's visa that is specially allocated to researchers and people who hold PhDs or master's degrees from outside of the EU and who are coming in to work at universities. So because of that special researcher's visa, it's really the application step is really easy. Um, your university provides you with a hosting agreement and some a contract and things like that. And you take that with you to the government department. Um, at the government department, it's difficult to find someone that <laughs> speaks English. I don't know how readily used the researcher visa is because it took me a while to kind of find, find the guy who deals with the researcher visa. And there was a bit of go here, no, come back here, no, go to this room, things like that. Mm -hmm. But once I found him, the process was really easy. Um, he took the forms, I had to fill in some things, do biometrics and things like that. And then within a couple of weeks, I had my visa. So it was a lot easier than I've experienced in other countries. Yeah, and uh, was there any problem in uh, in, in language-related things? So did you? Uh, I mean, you d didn't speak German, did you then? And no. so, and did you have a translator with you, or did it work in English? No, I went by myself. Um, mm -hmm. What was helpful was that I spoke to the people at my consulate first before I went. So they kind of told me, okay, this is what you need to do. Go here, do this. And I have a few friends who are from Vienna, so they were able to translate a few things for me online. But I went by myself and I think that's why it took a while for them to understand that I was looking for the area that dealt with the research department because I ended up spending some time in some queues that I had no business being in because I couldn't get a visa that way. So once I found the guy that dealt with the research visa, he spoke really good English and he was able to sort everything out for me really quickly. And we kept in contact by email so I knew what was going on every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And did you contact anyone at the university um, for support when it comes to the contractual situation or did you do all this on your own? Outside of Martina, I didn't, wasn't in contact with anybody else, but Martina was really helpful with letting me know kind of when to get the contract, what the hosting agreement means, what I need to take with me to the, con to the department and things like that. Just for the few people not knowing Martina, Martina is the organizational assistant of the department. Okay, so so that was your major source, right? It was, I mean, the, the, the closest person then in a way, right? So, yes, she was I the middleman between me and the university and HR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Emily, um, you are in a way in between, right? Because still in the EU, but probably <laughs> things will change um, when it comes to UK. Um, so perhaps you could report whether there's anything that you could add on, on, on the description given by Catherine and Tima so far. Okay, sure. So um, as you mentioned, I'm from the UK and I studied in the UK and then came to Vienna. And um, I'd say 
primarily one of the biggest hurdles for me was the language thing but I had a lot of support um, from friends at the time and also within the, the department um, I found the registration situation with the councils and so on um, fairly smooth other than the language situation because I was probably a bit different from um, some of the others I was living outside of Vienna so there's even less well-spoken English so it was a little bit more of a challenge um, but we got there in the end. Um, I think when it comes to the whole Brexit situation for now, it's seeming like there are deals trying to be made. And as I'm a resident now in Austria, then there are no problems and I have a job and so on. Um, when I think about um, perhaps hurdles or things that haven't been mentioned, it always connects back to the same thing with the language was perhaps like with contracts. That was a big thing I found. Um, at the university and kind of finding out how to do very basic things. So to check my salary online, for example, it all starts off in English and then you get taken to German links and you become very quickly familiar with um, online translators and certain words, which will take you to certain places, which um, I've found. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a big thing for me was the contract because coming from a legal background, I'm always, it's kind of drilled into me that you're bound by what you sign. Mm -hmm. at least in the UK it's a big thing and so reading um reading or trying to read a contract in a different language or trying to use a translator or um I mean everyone in the department was incredibly helpful so that mm -hmm. was great um but it just seems kind of wrong not being able to just view it and read it in a language you can understand mm -hmm. um but I think that's something which perhaps could be managed because all of the contracts are fairly similar. Mm. But that mm. was, yeah, that was kind of a strange thing for me in the beginning. I see, yeah. I see. Anthony, you are the oldest when it comes to the time spent in Vienna, almost three years now, I think, or two and a half, a yeah. little bit more than two and a half. So uh, I have two questions to you. The first one is, if you remember your start here, what was specifically difficult and, and, and what is still difficult after two and a half years? Yeah, so um, I'm originally coming from Poland and before coming to Austria, I also spent some time in Germany. And one of the first things that were quite difficult for me at the beginning was that I thought when I was coming there that I was speaking fairly decent German. And then I realized that there is a different kind of German being spoken in Austria. <laughs> that made quite some difference. Uh, but I must say, as I think I was yeah one of the first people coming from abroad to work uh, at the department. I received a lot of a lot of very nice support from from my colleagues mostly. So I did not receive, or maybe I was not enough looking for some support coming from you know the official administrative structures of the university, some sort of welcome services or sorts. But I did receive a lot of uh, support from my colleagues, which was very very helpful at the beginning. So that was my my primary source of knowledge, you know, about what has to be done and what, you know, some sorts of registrations and whatnot. Um, yeah, but still, you know, this, this language thing was, at least at the beginning, it was quite puzzling for me that also that it was not possible to get a contract in, in English. That was, that was quite interesting. Um, and what now? I don't know. I mean, after almost three years, I'm fairly happy with, with you know, the, the situation and the whole conditions of working abroad. And I think this was a, a lucky shot I had. <laughs> <laughs> good. good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah. Anything you would change or anything you would recommend to the university after several years? What to change when it comes yeah, I mean, to? I mean, I believe there is some sort of guideline hidden somewhere in intranet for foreigners coming to, to the university. I remember from, from other universities, for example, from Berlin, there was like a physical space that was really clearly visible in the middle of the campus. It was called some sort of welcome point or info point for, you know, all lost souls coming from abroad or for Erasmus or whatever that was, mm -hmm. where you had always some helpful people sitting there. And even though they were not able to solve your problems, they would always direct you where to go, what to do, in what's the appropriate procedure, what steps to take, steps to take and, and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this, this 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 would be very helpful at least at the beginning for many people coming to to work at the uni yeah i see um katarina for you i think it was specifically difficult because you didn't have too much time to move right did you and 
So how, how, how did you perceive then coming for the very first time to Austria and then start to work very quickly? How yeah, no, I don't have very much time. So I'm originally from the United States, but I'm lucky enough to also be a, a Greek and U.S. citizen. And so my Greek citizenship made it much easier bureaucratically for me um, because obviously I didn't have to go through the visa application process. Um, like Emily and Anthony sort of alluded to earlier, my colleagues were extremely helpful. So I had a lot of support. They on my first day, they just sat me down and sort of ran through the list of what I needed to do. And um, it went quite smoothly for me. I'd heard, you know, a few stories about, also like Emily, I was living in a, a more rural part of Austria, so not in, in central Vienna. Um, in central Vienna, everybody speaks English generally. Um, in rural areas, people speak English. Um, sometimes they don't like to speak in English. <laughs> so if you um, are going to an administrative office that's uh, smaller in a, in a rural town, you might find that English is limited. Um, I think as long as you try to speak some German, people are fairly kind to you and um, they try to help you along and you find a way to communicate. Um, I didn't really run into very many hurdles. Uh, I guess I was lucky in that my first experiences before I actually started speaking much German, um, I just dealt with people who spoke English. So that was mostly luck for me. Um, so far, I haven't really experienced any of the waiting times. Um, yeah. No extreme bureaucratic difficulties so far for me. Yeah. Interestingly, all of you did not mention social security so far as a problem. So are you too young to care about this or, or, or was everything clear there? Um, for me, it was pretty clear. The university and Martina are very helpful in that regard. So that's, yeah. that was very straightforward for me, at least. Yeah. And you, you, don't wonder yet whether this will end up in, in a pension sometime in, in, in the very late 21st century. So you receive, I think, um, regular mails that tell you, I think, what's accumulated. Um, and I think you can also access it online. So, uh, yeah, Martina yeah, tells fine. you what to do and, yeah. and <laughs> you <laughs> can fine. monitor it yourself. I see, I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah, Elizabeth, you you and me, we are the two who did it the other way around, right? So we we spent uh, we come from Austria, but we we went abroad. Um, so perhaps you start, and then I will talk a little bit about my experience. But perhaps starting with you, so what would you like to report? Is there anything you would like to report? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've moved around quite a lot uh, and worked at different European universities, uh, among them in the UK for a couple of years and in Slovakia and also in Italy. Um, uh, I think the, the biggest difference between what we've heard till now and uh, what I've experienced is the time gap, gap, because when I went abroad, that was almost 20 years ago, um, there was almost no information to be found online. There were no experts, social groups online. Um, and language, of course, however, did play a major role. I like to uh, some others. Um, however, I didn't expect people to know German. When I went, I was lucky enough. I when I went to UK to the UK and to Italy, I did speak the languages. But of course, uh, in Slovakia, I was uh, there without knowing more than hello and goodbye in Slovakian and, and I had to go through all the bureaucracy that Tima described first because uh, when I went to Slovakia to Nitra uh, I uh, the, the Slovakia was still not part of the EU so it was I was coming from a third country which meant I needed a work permit I needed a residence permit I needed a bank account I was paid in crones I think it was then mm -hmm. Um, I had to go to the public health officer and make an appointment there. Um, and all this in Slovakian. I got all my contracts in Slovakian. Um, that, of course, was challenging. However, I had lots of colleagues who helped me. Thank God. Um, but I didn't expect them 
to be able to speak English or to provide me with a contract in English or um, to be able to open an account in English, for example. It might be that it's because it was 20 years ago and um, the language, also English, was not that widespread then. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, although that was challenging, of course, in, in terms of languages, uh, in terms of bureaucracy, I think Naples, I, when I was in, in Italy, I was working in Naples, um, and that was far more demanding, I think. It was not the language, but it was organized very differently. And um, yeah, in my perception, not always well functioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I may contribute a little bit here, I, I spent uh, almost 20 years of my career in Germany, um, uh, almost most part of this in, in Hanover, so in the northern parts of Germany. So I did on on a very first view, I did not have a language issue, obviously. On, on if, but if you look a little bit more into detail, you see that there are plenty of language issues, and that would probably be also my very first recommendation. That even if you go from one German-speaking country to another one, don't expect that you really speak the culture, uh, the language, and don't expect that you understand the culture. It's a very different culture, and it's hidden underneath uh, the, the the surface, which is which looks, of course, very similar. Um, and I had, uh, I mean, I had plenty of experiences at the beginning about what, uh, how different the systems are, uh, although they look so similar. Um, and I just want to mention um, perhaps uh, two of them, um, three of them perhaps, uh, that were constantly a problem to me. So the first one is that when it comes to social security, uh, the system in Germany um, is very different, in particular when it comes to public servants. So public servants uh, and university professors, that's already a difference per se. Uh, university professors are still um, not hired on a on, on an contractual basis uh, like an average employee, but you, but you become a public servant, um, uh, which is a very different regime. Um, so university professors are this, and I, so I, I was this. And the first thing that I learned is that if you are this in Germany, you are not uh, part of the typical social security system like uh, private employees, but there is a completely different system uh, for you, uh, which is called the so-called Beihilfe system. So actually when I heard the word for the first time, I thought that this was an EU problem about funding uh, and, and, and not really something which was about my profession. Um, so this Beihilfe system means that you are not um, part of the social security system, but that your employer, so the state pays although you are sick. So when you have a sick leave, uh, it's your employer and it's not the social security paying. And it's also your employer then paying your rent if you are um, in rent and um, after um, the active time of your, of your career. And that is very difficult um, when you try to move back because this means that when from, coming from Germany back to Austria, then means that you again switch the system, um, you go back into a, um, 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 a privately run social security system in principle at least um, and that makes it very difficult to to calculate uh, the outcome of this when it comes to sick leaves but in particular when it comes to pensions so my first recommendation on this would be if you if you consider moving between Germany and Austria and if this comes with a with a change in the social security system you should talk to someone uh, who is an expert in this um, and when you are a professor, probably the, the best persons to talk to um, at in Germany is the Deutsche Hochschulverband, which is a privately run organization for university staff. Um, in Vienna, it was mainly the Berufungsservice, which is the, an institution at the University of Vienna, uh, consulting people incoming on a university professor level. So that was the first um, thing that was important to me. The second one, um, I, although I was in Germany for 17 years, um, I always had a flat in Vienna and I had parts of my, my family in Vienna, uh, at least in parts of the time, which meant that I was constantly moving between Germany and Austria, also when it comes to uh, tax issues. Um, and that was a constant problem. Uh, so tax and social security uh, was a nightmare because I constantly uh, needed to declare everything at two institutions and I, and I, 
and I spent a lot of time uh, trying to uh, to comply with all the rules. So the second recommendation would be you sh you will probably need if you are in a similar situation. Um, uh, you will need an advisor and probably you will need two advisors because each advisor uh, advises you only on the national legislation, which is either Austria or German, but there is not, uh, there is there are very few people who, who know both. Um, so you need this and you will need to pay for this. And that is something that you should consider when you evaluate whether or not a salary is attractive. Um, and, and the third point uh, that was important to me until the very end, I think, is uh, do not expect, even after 15 or 20 years in another country, do not expect that you, that, or at least I had the feeling after 15 or 20 years, I did not really feel socially at home there, although it was the same language and it was 20 years of experience and I, I knew everything and everyone. Still, in every a little bit awkward situation, um, I, I still had the, the the feeling that this is different. This is not uh, uh, the role that you would expect in your in your own social culture. So this will, at least in my in my case, it did not go away. It's not something that that goes away. But but you can adapt to this, and you sh and and on the other hand, you constantly learn. And when you are a lawyer, this is interesting because you always have. This, you know, you always have in your brain the second solution or the second uh, approach, which makes it very attractive um, to work uh, because you constantly get inspiration from the other legal system if you if you want this. Yeah, that was my experience. Um, coming back uh, was relatively easy, <coughs> although, although of course, again, social security and taxes and all this um, uh, needed a lot of calculation. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, one one thing uh, that I that I thought about when I when I signed my contract in Vienna was the uh, the situation when it comes to uh, copyright protected material that I had produced in Germany, and also on the other hand when I when I moved to Germany, so in how far I was entitled to take all this with me, uh, was that problematic to any of you? Any copyright related issues so far that you thought about? Have do you do you have you read what if there is anything about copyright in your contract and whether this has any implication on what you're doing or not doing? I can I can take that. So I was in private practice before, and it was pretty clear cut from my previous employment contract that I simply wasn't permitted to use any of the work um, that I had done earlier, and so. <laughs> While I could import the knowledge, none of the templates, none of the um, actual documents yeah. I had written could be used at the university. Yeah, but now when you uh, have you ever considered about what what the fate of the things that you're producing at the moment would be if you left? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not not particularly. I sort of assume that maybe I'm I'm too in, I have the the private firm culture too ingrained in me, but I assume that they remain with the university generally. Okay. Okay. Uh, could be. <laughs> could be. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that was not right. I mean, this is already interesting, right? Because I think uh, many people uh, do not really think too much about this, but the more senior you become, the more important, obviously, this is, right? Mm. Yeah. So no issue so far. Okay. Yeah. Who of you is in touch with your home culture at in Vienna? So, is there any anything that you would recommend on this? Try, trying to, I mean, are you meeting people from your home nations, or are you avoiding this, or, <laughs> or, to, just as it happens? I think for me, it's been important to actively seek out other African mm -hmm. people um, because. When I was moving here, I think one of the concerns for me was as a black woman moving to a place where I would be a minority, how society would accept me, how I would fit in, things like that. So actively seeking out um, other African people who live here and get to know their experiences has been quite important for me. Um, I've met a lot of people on LinkedIn, strangely enough, um, people who practice law here, who are from other parts of the continent, and I've gotten to know them. And I think that's been really helpful because it gives you a sense, a sense of a community that you can relate to and that understands kind of what you're going through and understands the experiences here. And it also allows you to kind of experience the Austrian culture while also keeping ties with your own culture and your own roots. Mm -hmm. So I think 
that's good if you if you come from um, a different part of the world and you might feel like you don't really belong it's good to find people who've been living here for years and then you see like okay this is possible and there are people who have lived here for years and eventually feel a part of the society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah to add to that i found um as Catherine kind of touched upon earlier, I found a lot of online resources, particularly on Facebook. So there's a great group called British in Vienna. And that was a really big thing for me, particularly with Brexit. So following all of the Brexit situation or even following the situation, the travel situation with um, coronavirus, that was a huge thing about when people are allowed back and what's going on. Um, and even if it was kind of just to find some really weird, obscure British food that I was missing, um, where to find it in Vienna, um, that was really nice. It's just kind of comforting. But I would definitely suggest um, seeking out Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups or even there are lots of blogs as well online. Mm -hmm. That was super helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think my starting point was also not to get into an international bubble. So I really tried not to seek out uh, people from Italy or the UK or so on. But I must say that it's really, really hard to actually socialize with Austrians. Um, so I think at some point I sort of gave up a bit and I realized that it was so much easier to um, go to Italian events, um, you know, international sort of political events and so on to meet people. Um, so I think in general, this is something that is very different from the countries I lived in because uh, people tend to move more. So I think um, Austrians in Vienna have been in Vienna for a lot of years and they have, um, you know, social circles that are solid and they don't feel the need to actually meet new people from other countries. So I think this is definitely um, the thing that was the hardest here in Vienna to actually try to integrate with Austrians. That was my <laughs> goal at the beginning, but it turned out to be very hard. Apart from, of course, like having uh, some Austrian friends that introduced me to um, some other Austrians. But I ended up having mostly um, a German group of friends now, which is rather ironic as the language is still German, but it's not even <laughs> of the country where I'm living. <laughs> But it, it will be good for your pronunciation, believe me. So, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and could you could you explain a little bit further, perhaps, what exactly is difficult when, when it comes to socializing with Austrians or Viennese? Are they not, I mean, are they not responding or are they not interested or both or? I think, um, well, I've never had issues with like rudeness or anything. I think um, it's just a matter that there isn't a need to have more friends and they are already very busy with their own sort of social activities and so on. So um, when you go into a city, I think that has um, a lot of international. Well, I must say it's also my first experience where I'm not like a regular student where you're in a group that don't doesn't know anyone so there is a stronger urge to sort of meet people um i think it's just very hard to actually reach mm -hmm. out um and it worked only going somewhere with an austrian and as a sort of uh, starting point but apart from that i think this is very very difficult because all the events or meetups that <laughs> i tried to go to at the very beginning when i knew absolutely no one in vienna it was only internationals, of course, because Viennese people don't really need to meet new people. So this was a bit of a pity because that was my starting point is that I really rejected all the international communities as I thought that this is a, the worst thing to do at the very beginning. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is very hard. And I also found that even online, they do mention that it's almost impossible to become friends with Austrians if you move to Vienna. So <laughs> yeah. So this, mm -hmm. I think, is a very famous and common thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anthony, did you did you make the same experience, or did you do anything against uh, it? Too, so? no, I must say my experience is slightly different, but this might again uh, be also due to the language difference. And also, I think I was lucky enough to to meet some some people I could call friends. Now they're Austrians, although I, as Catherine mentioned, I met them by uh, some other people that were Austrians already, right? So mm -hmm. people that I know used to work at our department or working at our department that introduced mm -hmm. me to someone else, mm -hmm. but which was, I think, a big advantage. Um, 
yeah, I mean, but after that, it's, I must say that the experience is slightly different probably from what, what Catherine was, was talking about. Mm-hmm. But I can imagine how, you know, starting from ground zero, this is, this is really, really challenging at the beginning, to say the mm-hmm. least. Mm-hmm. 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 So did any of you go to, I don't know, an international club or something for students or an inter- students association or, or anything like this? No. Because that's what I did. 30 years ago or so when I, when I studied in Paris and, and that was very helpful, but no longer. Okay. I think the student community, uh, sorry, just, um, so yeah. because I remember looking into this, the biggest issue is that a lot of international students here are Erasmus students or they're here mm-hmm. for like three months. Um, so if you're looking to meet people just for the sake of it, it's definitely, I mean, they do organize really nice events. But I think if you actually want to build a relationship, it's very mm-hmm. hard because, of course, they'll they're gone after a few weeks that you meet yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I think taking a German course is a really good way to meet people because um, I feel like I've made a lot of friends from my German course, and a lot of people who are doing the German courses live here and work here, or are spouses of people who live and work here. So it's a really good way to meet other international people who are living in Vienna. Yeah, I see. Uh, the German is, is an important topic, by the way, Tima. So, so how is it about learning German? How important is this and, 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 and who supports you in this? Um, so you can, I think you can get by without learning German if you live in Vienna, but it's a good thing, obviously, if you want to integrate into the society and feel like you're part of the community to, to at least understand the basics of the language and be able to have general conversation at the shops or at the restaurants and things like that. Um, so the German course, my first German course, the university paid for, and then um, moving forward, I get a discount on every course that I do. So it's really accessible. You can do it online now. And yeah, it's a really nice way to meet people and to learn and to just kind of understand more about Viennese culture and things like that. Mm-hmm. And it's run by the university. Yes. Yeah. And all of you are doing this, or is there any other provider that any of you would like to recommend when it comes to German classes? All of you do it at the university. Okay, so that's a good good sign then. Then, then seemingly they are either very cheap or very good, or both. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Chiara, is there anything else we should ask? Well, I think the most important things have been said. For me, it was very interesting to get to know the perspective of people coming to Austria because for me, of course, it wasn't challenging since I am Austrian. Yeah, but I remember when I started to study, I mean, already in Austria as an Austrian to start at the university was challenging then. And I and I, I think um, doing it uh, then on a professional level in another country is another thing. Of, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions and no more comments from any of you, are there any? If this is not the case, then thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you um, in the name of all our listeners and viewers. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you uh, via this channel. Uh, if there should be any questions, uh, we will find channels to address you via the MOOC. All the best and thank you and have a good day.